Picking up uh, chapter 3 this morning, and we'll be returning soon to our series uh, on Genesis. But I hope this, uh, this little interlude has been, has been an encouragement to you, as it has been to me. 1 John chapter 3, we'll begin verse, uh, reading in verse 11 through the end of the chapter, uh, but the sermon this morning will be focusing on verse 24. This is God's Word. There is no substitute for it. There's nothing else that we can come up with that will even begin to compete with how the Spirit works. So, let's give it our attention. The Spirit wrote it for us. And He's going to give us illumination to it. Because it is His Word. It is without error. 1 John chapter 3. Verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth, and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as He has commanded us. Whoever keeps His commandments abides in Him, and He in them. And by this we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. Thus far, God's Word. Please be seated. We've seen over the course of our study of 1 John together these past months that it is a letter of true Christian assurance. John has been writing to a church that had split because of false teaching. So John is reassuring us and them of our true faith in Christ that is lived out in love for God and love for one another. We are not perfect. We are not without sin. However, we are called to love and obey God according to His Word, the Bible. John says here in verse 24, Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God and God in Him. Kids, what is the meaning of life? Very, very little participation this morning. Kids, what? Kids, up here, pay attention. What is the meaning of life? To enjoy God and glorify Him forever. To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Thank you. We glorify and enjoy Him by living according to His Word. God is concerned with your heart, He's concerned with what you love, what you desire, because all of your words and all of your actions flow out of your heart. Here's an important question. Why should you obey God? The Bible says we should, but why? 
Well, the first catechism says that we should love and obey God because He made me and takes care of me. Can you make God love you more than He already loves you in Christ? No, you can't. Can you earn anything from God that He hasn't already freely given to you in Christ? No. Do your good works have anything to do with God saving you from hell and bringing you to live with Him eternity, eternally in heaven? Does God place conditions upon you being His son or daughter in that sense? No, he doesn't. We read in the Bible over and over again that salvation, God's grace, is a free gift that he gives to us. Not only can't we earn it, but, but we don't. Even if he had held it out there as a possibility, we would not be able to earn it. We would not be able to be good enough to earn anything from God then what is the proper place for obedience in the Christian life? I want you to listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 2. He says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God saves us by His sovereign grace for His glory. However, He saves us with a purpose. Our lives have meaning, which is to glorify Him, to enjoy Him forever. Paul says we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. See, when we're saved, we're given a new heart, a new life. Our eyes are opened to the blessings of serving God in the way that He has prescribed for us in the Bible. Think about it this way. Does God ever ask you to do anything that is bad for you? No. No. Think about all the various commandments that were given in the Bible. Don't murder, don't steal, don't lust, don't hate, don't lie, love your neighbor, show hospitality, bear one another's burdens, be humble, and on and on and on. Are any of these things bad for you? Is it some kind of a burden for you to be called to live in this way as a Christian? Or does God just want to spoil your fun? Look around at the world. There's no shortage of examples every day around us. People indulging the desires, the lusts of their flesh, worshiping various idols, and always looking for something bigger and better, trying to find some sense of happiness and fulfillment. But they're always reaching, and they're never finding it. Listen to what John says later in chapter 5, 1 John 5. He says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. As you serve Christ in your life, that is evidence that you are living in Him and He is living in you. This shows that you have a vital union with Christ, that you are united together with Him. Even though He's raised from the dead and He's in heaven, you are united to Him, you are one with Him by the Holy Spirit. Kids, let me ask you another question. See if you do any better this time. Have you ever wondered how big God's house is? Yes. I mean, we know that He made the entire universe, everything that we see and know, and even so much more that we don't even have telescopes that are powerful enough to see yet. He must have a big house. He's a big God. 
And after all, he has told us that he's going to bring all of his people home to live with him forever in heaven. You want to hear something really amazing, kids? Something really cool? God loves us so much that not only did He send Jesus to live for us, to die for us, and to raise Him from, dead in, from death and power, but also to make us His home. Have you ever thought about that? That you are God's house? That's something different, isn't it? I'm not sure all of you kids have thought about it that way before. This is what John means here when he says that God abides in us. God abides in us. He lives in us. He dwells in us. He makes us his house. Now in the Old Testament, God had the Israelites build him a house. And it was a really nice house. It had gold everything. Right? And what was this house called? It had a special name. Heaven. No, the, the, the building in the Old Testament that God had the Israelites built where they would go to worship Him and where He would dwell in their midst. The temple. Excellent. This was called the temple. A physical building in a physical location. Does anyone know what city it was in? I heard Bethlehem. We'll talk about Bethlehem more later in the month. It was in Jerusalem. That's right. So why don't we today have a big golden temple like they did in the Old Testament? You ever thought about that? God had them build this building in the Old Testament, and it was really important to the life and worship of His people. They surrounded, they, they lived around the temple. And if they lived out of town, they would travel to come to the temple to bring their sacrifices to God. Well, in Jesus, in the new covenant, God has made us his temple. We read in 1 Corinthians 3, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Wow. How many gods do we worship? One. one. Okay. We worship one God. We are monotheists. That sets us apart from most all other world religions there. We're monotheistic. God is one. However, the Bible teaches our one true God exists in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These persons are all three the same in substance. They're equal in power and glory, though they each play a different role in our salvation. And we see that here. The Spirit is given to us sent to us by the Father to apply to us all the benefits of Christ's finished work. Without the Spirit, you can have no participation in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Without the Spirit, you receive no benefit of God's grace. The Spirit does the work of regeneration, bringing the spiritually dead to new life in Christ, doing that heart surgery that we read about in Jeremiah, taking out that heart of stone and putting in a heart of flesh. He gives us faith. He helps us to grow in holiness through His work of sanctification. You know, many of you kids have probably memorized the fruit of the Spirit. And it's important to remember that these are the fruit of the Spirit. This is the fruit of His work in our hearts. It's not the fruit of Ali, or the fruit of Isaac, or the fruit of Andrew. It's the fruit of the Spirit, right? I can't take credit for it. When I see myself growing in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, I can't say, well, doing pretty good. Yeah. 
No, because it's not about me. If I see myself growing in grace, it's cause for me to thank the Lord and to praise Him. He is the one who receives the glory because He's the one that's doing the work. And thankfully, He does it. He does that work in our hearts and in our lives. It's His people. Whoever the Father gives His Spirit to is His adopted child in Christ. He makes us to be His son, makes us to be His daughter, makes us to be part of His family. Listen to how Paul puts it in Romans 8. He says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. The Spirit opens our eyes to understand, to believe God's word. That is why he doesn't add anything to it or ever work in contradiction to it. If you want to grow as a Christian, you need to read your Bible. It's just that simple. There's, there's no way around it. It's not rocket science or rocket surgery or brain science. If you want to grow as a Christian, you need to read your Bible. The Spirit gave it to us for that specific purpose. Kids, if you want to, if you want to get big muscles... What do you have to do? Work out. You gotta work out. You have to exercise those muscles. All right. It's. I mean, there there may be a million different DVDs you can buy and programs you can do at the gym and and ways to encourage you to do that. But it it's just that simple. You want to make a bigger muscle, you gotta work that muscle. You gotta work it regularly. Your pastor back used to say, "Hustle, hustle, hustle. Build a great big muscle." <laughs> well, this the exact same is true for reading the Bible. You want to grow as a Christian? you got to read that Bible. Sorry. There's no other way around it. You know, to, to expect to grow in your faith and to mature as a Christian and not crack open, open the Bible is like sitting on your couch watching TV and eating, eating Cheetos and expecting to become uh, Mr. Universe. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> if you want to grow in grace, you have to use the means of grace that God has given. <coughs> God always <clears throat> keeps his promises. You know that, kids? God always keeps his promises. Uh, us parents, we, we, like, we would like to say we always keep our promises, but we don't. Sometimes we don't, we don't foresee things that are going to happen to interfere with us doing the things we've said we're going to do. Things come up, um, things change. But that doesn't happen with God. God always keeps His promises. He always finishes what He starts, and He never abandons His people. Your salvation in Christ is guaranteed. It is guaranteed. Paul says in Philippians 1, I'm sure of this. There's no doubts here, right? I'm sure of this. That he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That's a verse that encourages me. When I'm tempted to be discouraged in my, my walk as a Christian. I say, no, Paul is sure of this and I'm sure of this. That God is not going to leave me here. He's going to finish what he started. Do you, do you know that... Well, let me ask you this, kids. What guarantee has God given that He will give you everything He has promised you as His adopted son or daughter in Jesus? What is His guarantee that He's going to give you this inheritance that He's promised, that He's going to bring you home eternally with Him? Kids, do any of you know what this guarantee is? What has He given us to guarantee our salvation? The Bible says, and I didn't really expect you to know it, but I want you to think about it so you're going to be listening when I give you this answer. Because when I was your age, I, I wouldn't have known the answer to this either. 
because it's not Jesus in that sense. It's not the, the, the regular Sunday school answer. The Bible says that God has given you the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. The Spirit whom we've been talking about this morning is a guarantee. Paul says it in Ephesians 1, he says, uh, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. The Spirit who lives in us, as God makes us His home, is a guarantee of, of that God is going to keep His promise. That God is going to, to make good on everything that He has promised to us in His Word. God does not make empty promises. He says, I will give you the Spirit as a guarantee that this is going to happen. We also read in 2 Corinthians 5 that God has given us the Spirit as a guarantee, so we are always of good courage. And not only is the Holy Spirit a guarantee of future blessings, He also builds us together now as God's family. He does that work of knitting our hearts together in love. The unity of the body of Christ is a fruit of the Spirit's work. He gives us that unity. The Spirit builds the church. He doesn't save us to live alone, but instead He unites Christians with fellow Christians. He builds communities to worship God, to live the Christian life together in mutual love and service, and to reach out to the world around them. Without His work, we would not be here. Plain and simple. This church would not exist without the Spirit's work. But because He is here, and He is at work in each of us, and with us as a whole, as a church family, we have confidence to move forward with the important work of church planning. Because He is doing that work. If it was up to us, it would be a hopeless task. But with God, all things are possible. And so we are called to sow the seed of God's Word, to cast it far and wide, not knowing what kind of soil it will fall on. That's God's department. Okay. As Paul said, one plants, one waters. But who brings the growth? God. God. Okay. One plants, one waters, but God brings the growth. And so we're called to sow that seed of God's Word, to plant it, to water it, and to trust in the Lord to bring the growth. And so serve the Lord with gladness, with thankfulness. I know Thanksgiving's over, so we don't have to be thankful anymore, right? <laughs> no, that's not true at all. For us, our lives as Christians should be characterized by a constant thanksgiving. Thankfulness is the primary motivation for the Christian life. To be thankful for what God has done for us. He has saved us. And so we serve Him because our hearts are overflowing with thankfulness. As we talked about before, we're not serving Him to try to earn salvation from Him or to try to earn some special blessing. We're serving Him because we delight to do that. Because He has done everything for us. He has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's held nothing back from us. He has given us His Holy Spirit in our hearts. He has made us His own. And more than that, He's made us His children. And He's given us an inheritance that's unfading. And that we have the Spirit as a guarantee that, that we will take possession of it when He calls us home to heaven. Out of all the people of the world, we are to be the most thankful. May we be reassured and reinvigorated to love and obey God through our Christian service this week. May the Lord bless our humble efforts by the work of His Spirit to grow and establish His church here in our midst. And may those who are still dead in their sins 
those who are living as spiritual zombies. They're the walking dead, literally. The walking dead. Dead people walking. They don't know true joy in Christ. They don't know what it is to be loved by God. They don't have an unfading hope. May the Lord use us to bring them the good news of Jesus. That our thankfulness will be on display. And that He might use us in any way possible uh, as instruments of His Holy Spirit so that He might make them His house too. Amen. Amen. Let's pray.